<laughs> okay, really happy to be here, and, uh, and I would just like to point out for the record that this is not the first time that Stephen Harnett has completely altered the uh, contents of my consciousness, so <laughs> having bequeathed his uh, extremely difficult job to, to me a few years ago. Um, so, um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, as I'm sure most everybody knows here, Stephen Harnett Harn um, invented BBS, and uh, when he could no longer bear its crushing weight or something, <laughs> he handed it over to Paul Bloom and me. So, uh, and that t is a large proportion of my consciousness. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to really uh, change the subject here a lot and talk about um, evolution of brains and what we understand about them and what we can use, we can use our growing knowledge of the evolution of brain to um, bootstrap our way into the mapping of particular kinds of complex cognition onto neural structures, but that we usually get it wrong. So I'll, that's what I'll be talking about here. And here's my um, general, here's the general idea. So we have uh, complex cognition in the human brain, and here we have some kind of phylogeny. And the idea is, can you identify some structure, some singularity, some kind of organization um, in here that you can map on to the organization of, uh, um, of cognition? So here, for example, we have located the language organ as an excrescence on the um, standard vertebrate brain. and. And that way we could figure out, okay, this is the part of the brain that um, is unusual in humans, and humans have language, and therefore this is the part of the brain that must be responsible for it, and that's how we would use a singularity were the word, world so simple. Um, but obviously it's not. Uh, we act like it should be a lot of the time. So what I want to uh, talk about is, is how to get better <laughs> at that search for differences and singularities. And the way to do that is to um, understand how brains change. Now, I have this real like, long texty slide here about you know, what could you possibly change in brains from, from one species to another. And um, you know, considering the cells and connections, you could change almost anything from their oxidative metabolism through how they communicated to each other, to um, how they were arranged, how many of them there were, how you, how you put them in layers and components, um, you know, how much you allow one thing to connect the other, and so on and so on. This is not even meant to be an exhaustive list, just a mental exercise of how many things you could think of. Well, then the, then the question is, we're not helpless in this thing. If we look across the variation in vertebrate and mammal brains, what actually does change. And so now just qualitatively, I want to talk about these things. And what, what you see is that um, in, if you look across vertebrate evolution, you find that there's um, particular kinds of things that change a great deal from one brain to the next. And, and there are um, things that change very little. So basic cell physiology, what kind, you know, how you run the um, metabolism of neurons, which basic transmitters you have, like norepinephrine, serotonin, are you know, not, not only uh, consistent across vertebrates, but invertebrates as well. But receptors vary more. Um, the distribution of those changes some, and what, and, a, and um, then second modulators that are gating the responses of those things um, vary a lot cell classes, um, and by this I mean um, from simple undifferentiated neurons uh, with particular kinds of neurotransmitters you've identified to things that have much more elaborate particular things like arbors and classes and inclusions. Um, cell arrangements, things like layers and nuclei. Um, one thing that uh, goes up with physiology is number of parts, and by this I mean the basic segmental organization of the brain. So from the first sharks for over 500 million years, the 
fundamental number of segments and embryonic zones stays very stable. We don't add any new, uh, new pro-telencephalons in front of the telencephalon. We continue with those same components. Um, relative size of parts changes, relative innervation of parts um, corresponds to that. And I'm going to be going back through this, by the way, to, to talk about sources of variation of this thing to make this more specific um, in the next slide. Uh, Long-range connectivity um, is an interesting case, which I'll be talking about most today. And this is something that is, for the most part, very stable. But occasionally, you get a big change. And when you do, it's an interesting one. Um, Short-range connectivity, how big your dendrites are. Um, not so much. Now, there's a way of looking across this, um, which is different. You ask about how much do things change, but they ask in what way do they change. And what I want to um, talk about here is, is sort of predictability and unpredictability of the kind of changes, and look mostly now at our large ones. So what, uh, what, what kind of things change predictably? Um, Start with the blue here. Relative size of parts, relative innervation of parts, short range connectivity, and cell types, which is going to be a mixed bag. Um, so what's what's going on in this thing is that brains vary extremely in size, but they vary very predictably in size. So that as you as brains get larger, um, the components get larger in a in a very organized and predictable way, different from one structure to the next. Um, the innervation of parts tends to follow that, so that as one part of the brain becomes predictably larger than another, its percent ownership of targets that they compete for will change in the direction of the, of the, lar the, the structure that gets larger. Um, in this, so there's a component of size here. There's another component in predictability, which basically has to do with basic Kebbian mechanisms. So um, things vary a lot, but they vary um, in ways that you can understand if you understand the structure of the environment and how neurons respond to them. So if, if an uh, animal has um, overlapping visual fields and the two eyes and two units are... are um, Input is competing for a cell that comes from the two eyes. The Hebbian mechanisms will predictably, from one end to the next, tell you how the um, inputs are going to arrange themselves. And this is a very cross-animal um, uh, issue. Cell types is, a, is an interesting combination of predictability and predictability, and both features that produce predictability, which are changing in size, and sort of general Hebbian mechanisms. First off, as brains get bigger, absolutely, the number of cells human beings can differentiate in them gets larger. Okay, so if you look at a small lamprey, the number of cells that you could list and say, I can tell this one from other unvisual appearance or cell inclusions may be in the small tens, but once you talk about a, um, you know, a large, the hippopotamus brain, you're going to be in the thousands of distinguishable cells. Okay? Um, and those, so that changes with size, and it also uh, changes with heavy and mechanisms. We'll get different kinds of constellations of arbors. And you'll also get um, genuinely new cell types. So things that had been excitatory moving their position and becoming inhibitory. This happens in the primate cortex and some mammalian cortex several times, for example. So we have an interesting thing going on here. How about unpredictable changes? Well, this is one that's of, of real interest, and there's a lot of good research going on now. The paradigmatic case of that for me is the difference between being a monogamous and a promiscuous vole. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is a well-known story to everyone, um, but um, in the wilds of the United States uh, somewhere, and I can never remember which way it goes with these two voles, um, that um, one, um, one kind of vole, prairie vole and a montane vole, one has, one has um, 
uh, seasonal or pa past seasonal monogamy, which means that they have they share parental care, stay in the same borough together, and are socially monogamous. They're not perfectly faithful, but then you know. Whereas the other uh, kind of vole is um, like a standard, more of the standard rodent, which is promiscuous and single parent. And the only you can change the behavior of one to the other by the by knocking in um, vasopressin and oxytocin receptors into their brains in the appropriate places and turn the promiscuous vole into a monogamous one. And what this allows is basically the attachment of the system that recognizes individuals to the rewarding effects of sort of sexual behavior by a rather, what looks like a rather simple genetic change and make a large um, difference in what the animal finds rewarding and how it allocates its time and then presumably further organizes his brain. Some really wonderful work going on is of Jim Goodson looking at all kinds of different um, birds which who give you a lot more contrast than mammals in terms of how many birds um, like to stay together, whether they're monogamous or not, um, whether they're territorial or not, or aggressive, how seasonal their behavior is. And the same kind of almost churning of, of neuromodulator presence and receptors to cause linkages and unlinkages of these motivational systems is sort of a good way to characterize those. So um, Hans Hoffman and Steve Phelps are, in fact, putting together a big database on this kind of change. Um, cell arrangements, um, something that's very impressive. Layers and nuclei, how organized um, from the sort of cerebellar-like, uh, you know, circuit board thing to a just collection of, of randomly connected neurons. Um, you see this kind of change a lot. Um, there is one sort of hidden developmental process under here that makes this um, a kind of emergent property in, in the in not in the more in the rather boring sense of emergent just tends to emerge a lot. Um, when you make a large brain, it takes longer to make it, um, and so if you're producing cells over time, and cells have to migrate some distance to get to another place, uh, layers are produced. So layers are a constant feature of larger brains in different kinds of organization. So. Um, not necessarily, but often. So, so what, what, what comparative neuroanatomists have been doing for a while is starting to amass a large corpus of data about ways that brains can change. And this is the kind of thing that hopefully would allow us not to identify, say, singularities anymore, but what substantive changes are and are not. Um, so I want to talk about two things. Um, well, I want to talk about how this is often um, just misunderstood so that we tend to um, invest the cortex with all of, of uh, magical human properties because we don't understand how predictable the cortex is. And then, um, taking this as a lesson to myself, I want uh, an idea, of, <coughs> I'm going to propose a... Uh, idea about the, the reorganization of pain in humans, specific to humans. I'm going to argue that humans ha ha experience pain in a way um, most other primates or mammals do not because of the stabilization of altruism and other kinds of helping in human societies, and then try to use information from comparative neuroanatomy in the way that I've described to sort of start to get at that question. And, uh, and I expect that to be controversial. So, okay. Um, and in fact, I would, this is just about the third time I've taken this on the road, so I would appreciate your attacks and questions of, about that. Anyway, so starting with thinking about the cortex. Um, all this work is with my longtime colleague, Dick Darlington, and postdoc, Christine Charvet. So, so this is just basic brain lometry, and we don't do the statistics this way, but what we are looking at here is just the size of the brain, absolutely, 
on a large scale versus the size of the different parts of the brain which together make up the whole brain. And each one of these parts is stepped by the um, uh, constant indicated there so we can just pull them apart on this y-axis. And what we had been doing is just looking at mammals here, the red line. So, so let's just take a, in this case, the human brain is our largest one. So the, this is the red line and this, this is this line here. So the red dots look at the size of each one of these components um, plotted against the whole brain for, for humans. Um, we had been looking at mammals, but now we've added in their avian brains and um, sharks and um, some teleos amphibians. And, um, and the overwhelming message of this, this graph, although there are interesting deviations where we can look for singularities related to animal behavior, is its utter predictability. So as brain size increases absolutely, each part of the brain increases at a predictable rate, and each one of those rates are different. So, um, so here these are the big chunks of the brain. So we have medulla versus mesencephalon versus diencephalon. And, then, and the statistical distinction you can see here is that the whole telencephalon and the whole cerebellum um, increase at a higher rate with increasing brain size than all the rest, and that starts back uh, with sharks and rays and teleos and continues. So if you're going to make a bigger brain in all these independently evolving radiations, if you have, if you're going to um, put, allocate excess tissue, it goes into telencephalon and cerebellum. It's important to, to realize that we're looking at log scales here and, and, and just how big this is if you were looking at actual brains in front of you. So here's a, um, so down here we have, this is kind of a hybrid linear log scale. So this is the log one, but this is how the cortex as you go from here to here on the scale actually changes as plotted on a linear scale. So we're going from something that goes to a less than 20% of the brain volume to over 80% of the brain volume of a very large animal, okay? So brains are predictable, but we don't compare the right things and we make the same mistake all the time. So this is your textbook view and you compare, this is a, in fact, not the scale, far too large mouse or rat brain um, compared to a human brain and you look and you see the difference there is a giant amount of, of cortex and using the Singularity rule, we said, well, then it's certainly the cortex that is different about humans. But the previous graph I showed you had humans as the highest point, and so that sort of reinforced the notion that's special, but we didn't have to do that. And there are brains that are absolutely larger than the human brain. And if you plot the, telen the percent telencephalon or percent cortex against total brain, animals with bigger brain have even more. They stay on the same exact path. So imagine if we're looking in, the corte in, in, a, in a common textbook, we have here the human against the elephant, and then we're trying, well, where is consciousness going to be? Um, with, this, <laughs> with this comparison, well, um, the complex things, the language, the you know, planning for the future, clearly it has to be in the cortex. Um, when we take these as our it, as our comparison animals, we've got something that at least has to be understood in a much more subtle way. Now, you have, are free to credit the dolphin and the elephant and numerous whales with as much complexity and language and uh, you know, symphony-making abilities and so forth as you wish, but I can assure you that the, um, that the way in which their brain enlarges is typical. I would put a large amount of money on the fact that their network and sort of their network structure, small world structure is probably rather similar. So I think what we, this is an argument for is for, um, first off, stop paying so much attention to the cortex all the time. Look elsewhere in the brain for reorganizations. and. Um, and 
make sure that um, hypotheses, hypotheses that you um, advance will, can respect species differences like this as well as the traditional monkey or rat to human one we often make. Um, this is just a little aside point. Um, it's, it's difficult to find if, if you, clearly our brains are really, are really large, but finding a sort of exact physical um, measurement that will indicate that uniquely um, really doesn't exist. So if you take the simple ratio, in this case of this is Jerison's work, brain to body size, we occupy this um, nice high point, but if the ratio, just because of the nature of ratios, if you go down to the relatively small brains and the relative allometry, in fact, the um, ferrets and shrew uh, shrews and mice and so forth have a larger brain to body size than do humans, just because of the way those two structures scale. This Jerison thing, which is diff you know, the um, point of humans with respect to the regression line, is a normative measure. It depends on what other animals you put in that line. So there isn't really an absolute thing about brain size that, um, that isn't highly qualified that will get you uniquely to humans. And overall, I, have, I can't, um, I'm not going to present you enough data on this, but you see this um, basic continuity of fundamental organization, sort of non-exceptionalism of human brain um, throughout on a structural basis. And to me, th that begins to argue for a, um, a real suggestion for continuity and basic mechanisms as well, which has to be cashed out, of course, but I, that often is being cashed out. So here's another thing. Um, surely it's not just the volume of the cortex, it's its wonderful organization. It's the fact that it has layers. And you'll see in a very odd way in, when people describe the cortex, they'll describe um, the more layers it has is better and uh, you know, four layers is not good and two layers is primitive as if you know, how many different uh, you know, stacks of things you make had some relationship to consciousness or complexity or something. But so we've got layers in the cortex. We have columns. They can be shown to have physiological significance. What they haven't actually been ever shown, I'll argue, is, that, is to be um, demonstrably better than some other organization. Um, they may way well be, but it, we have just sort of assumed that they are. So here is the... Um, a comparison of forebrain with a, um, by um, Tony Reiner for rat versus pigeon, and I think you can see the neocortex here and see the large nuclear non-layered masses in the comparable areas of the pigeon that have been staying just for cells, um, for acetylcholinesterase, and for embryonic origin. Um, well, I, I don't, I want to challenge this with just one observation. This is from Christine's work. And go back to that allometry picture that you just saw, looking at telencephalon, and concentrate on the red versus the blue dots. All the red dots are mammalian species. The blue dots are birds um, going up in brain size and the size of the telencephalon. And what you see is two lines that are virtually superimposed. All right? So if it is the case that somehow a nuclear, non-layered, non-columnar organi organization of the brain is um, somehow inefficient or non-working, I would expect the size of this to start falling off at high layers. And what is, and the kinds of birds that are up here at the high end are the, um, you know, the clever ones that you read about in the news, the jackdaws and, and crows and, and so forth that are doing the uh, uh, solving puzzles and remembering what they should, you know, pack for tomorrow for their food suitcases and stuff. Um, so, so we have this um, independent of structure, this real overlay in size. And what we can understand, I should mention that the reason we can do this now and why we couldn't do this before is we know where each part of these brain come from. And so the kind of what you can then do is break down each part of these of the brain by embryonic 
origin. And we have really it's talking about um, four bits here. The, the, this is called the pallium, the cloak, the medial, dorsal, lateral, and so and ventral. And the dorsal pallium in birds is layered. Um, it's visual and somatosensory. Um, the, it's the dorsal pallium that gives rise to the whole cortex in mammal and really expands, where it's the lateral pallium um, that uh, it gives rise to most of the organization in birds. And, um, and the way you can understand this is that, um, the way we like to understand it is that the mammalian cortex takes on a lot of the connectivity of the dorsal pallium and keeping the organization, the layers, uh, takes on, the, like, excuse me, the connectivity of the lateral pallium while taking on the layered structure of the dorsal pallium. So if you look up here at these sub, sub areas by mammal, by according to embryonic origin, the basic thing is that um, dorsal pallium is less in birds, lateral pallium is higher in birds, and you add them together and you get this single line for proliferation. So perhaps the uh, cortex is, uh, is special and uh, has some um, virtue by layers alone, but I think now we have to go one step more and find out, okay, so what it is what is it about laminar organization that we think is the advantage in this case? Okay. Here's something that is very peculiar. Um, this is, these things called von Economo neurons. So let me quote this. As of yet, we do not know the mechanisms responsible for the differentiation of complex social emotions that ad activate FI and ACC, but we do know that VENs, von Economo neurons, are a recently evolved population that probably serves to relay the output of the processing within um, FI, the infrafrontal and ACC, to other brain structures. Their large size suggests that VENs may relay a fast, intuitive assessment of complex social situations to allow the rapid adjustment of behavior in quickly changing social situations. Um, my uh, extremely scientific Google search came up with um, about 60 papers either just either summarizing this or sort of following up on the same thing. This, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So here's a typical pyramidal cells. Here's a von Economo neuron. They were described a long time ago. Now this, this was John Allman's just, um, I think just sort of off the head, you know, offhand speculation about um, what, uh, how these things might be evolved in some circuitry. but. It was seized on by any number of people, but only in the last couple of years have anyone, has anyone tried to do anything physiological to look at the, what these neurons are connected to, what animals they're found in, um, and there is no work of any electrophysiology whatsoever on these things. So, um, so not recently evolved and not in social mammals, so um, these, uh, Vens are found in whales, elephants, apes, humans, but also monkeys, prosimians, the pygmy hippopotamus, the Atlantic walrus, and the Florida manatee. Okay, um, uh, the, you, and, and the large brain mammals can you know, so also include things like the orangutan, who you know, are not social at all. They don't have special transmission speed. In fact, they look to be just the size of the standard pyramidal cells in the cortex, um, and there aren't any studies. This thing about no connectivity studies just changed, and it turns out that they, uh, this is the same people here, Booty and Hoff, that they have the uh, connectivity of a standard pyramidal cell for those areas of the cortex. Um, they were first implicated both in autism and um, also several kinds of dementias, but they're simply in the part of the cortex that gets affected in dementias. Um, and they're not differentially involved in those things. So, um, so basically, this is a, someone's um, offhand suggestion that that generated ten years of of work with no substantive uh, detail to flesh out that argument. So, what's the moral? <laughs>
we have an extremely low standard for accepting evidence about human exceptionalism. Okay? <laughs> and we simply have to pay attention to that. So it's, whether it's the cortex or the Islamic, you know, in this sort of extreme case in the Vano Kahneman neurons, um, we just uh, need to step back every time we make one of those statements and evaluate its content. Um, and then I mean, that we, time and again, we find continuity in brain structures. But not the moral. Comparing brains is useless because we're getting more information and we can now start to make substantive statements, at least in a number of domains, about what constitutes a significant change. Okay, so now we're going to veer off wildly and talk about, talk about pain. Um, so, well, um, doing my regular developmental um, neurobiology, minding my own business, I was looking, I was working in Brazil with my uh, colleagues, Mike Dyer, Luis Carlos Silvera, and a number of others. And we were looking at the very early changes that turn a uh, diurnal eye, such as in a capuchin monkey, into a uh, nocturnal eye. How few changes could you make, which we published uh, recently. And I was sitting there, as this required us to do cesarean sections and um, look at uh, to look at the expression of genes in these early eyes to contrast um, what was happening in early development to produce a large constellation of changes you have in a nocturnal eye. And after about four years, I noticed something really odd. It was uh, slow of me, I know, but um, that uh, the, the, the surgery would go quickly. Um, you know, they're very good surgeons there to do the C-section, and then the monkeys would be sewn up and then be in the little recovering room. And 40, 50 minutes later, the monkeys are up, you know, if not restrained, climbing on the walls of their cages, um, sharing sandwiches, trying to get into fights, all sorts of things like that, just in a very short time, exhibiting the sort, of, sort of the full range of, of normal monkey behavior. Now, I've had two C-sections myself, and there was no climbing, no, no bickering with the needs, okay? Um, so, so all of a sudden, I, I, and then I thought all the, the usual suspects that are brought out, well, we're bigger. Well, like the poochin monkeys are pretty big. And uh, you think of all sorts of, you know, that there's uh, somehow our immune systems are compromised, but all this stuff suddenly seemed to me to not make sense. And so I, a lot of things clicked together. And so here's the thesis I want to advance here. That, and let me read it out. A large class of somatic sensations and states have become painful in humans, which are not painful in closely related species because we can successfully seek help from each other. Those who were motivated by pain and sought help had, better, had a better chance of survival, and thus the extension of pain is stabilized by evolution. So what I want to go over quickly is the assumptions that, that underlie that then some evidence in support of the theory, and then how you might use comparative neuroanatomy to investigate if pain systems have actually changed. So, assumptions. Okay, so um, I'm going to assume that there is basic continuity in perceptual mechanisms and experience across animals. Um, so that is, I'm going to say that animals do in fact feel pain. It's going to be the details and circumstances that, that matter. So anyone who has stepped on their cat's foot and noted the enthusiastic response will probably um, at least go for the behavioral version of this. So that this is not a question of somehow uh, claiming that animals do not feel pain. This is a question that, that, that animals feel pain in circumstances where it is useful for them to feel pain. Okay. The second thing is that altruism is stabilized in uh, the human population, which is um, generalized helping. I don't, it doesn't matter at all uh, what form of selection gets credited for this, some group selection, kin selection, whatever, but simply to acknowledge that, that, that um, cooperative behavior is very stabilized in humans, and if you ask for help quite often, you will get it even if the person is not your mother. Okay, so there's that, that altruism proceeds. 
then following, uh, um, I'll elaborate a little bit, pain is a hybrid of motivation and sensation. From, and most of this is one step past uh, the work of Patrick Wall. And but the most important thing, it's basically an evolutionary argument that is often missing in discussions of pain in the medical setting. The, the reason, the fundamental reason for pain is always functional and instrumental. It's to take action to stop injury in the case of stepping on your cat's foot, you know, alert the perpetrator, maybe alarm them. So to stop that. Um, and, then, and then after that, if you have the option, to protect your injured parts. Um, you know, so to go and, and rest if you can or not put full weight on your damaged paws or to um, take time off and allow time to, um, to have recovery. So those, those are the reasons why you'd make a fuss to begin with to stop whatever is the source of the pain and then why you would later have a continuing response from the damaged tissue so that you allow yourself recovery time. So, so those are the, there we're starting from. Here's the, so I'm going to talk about three kinds of evidence. The placebo response, um, obligate midwifery, and uh, then get on to anatomy. So, um, so Patrick Wall was one that argued that, and, and showed that, that pain is not a, um, a uh, response to just tissue damage is not a sensation, but it has an obligatory motivational component to, to stop it or deal with it in some way. And he, he uh, tied this to the um, well-known placebo response. So the first part of this, pain is not uniquely tied to tissue damage, but it signals potential damage. So the two best examples of that is that you um, people um, take their hand from a hot plate that will in time damage them, but it is not presently damaging them. Okay. So it's predictive. There's one kind of thing. Also, there's a, can, there's a story that you hear all the time about um, uh, soldiers in the war. So, you know, World War II soldier, you know, probably a movie gets a giant hole in their leg, but they continue fighting, and then they make their way back to the base camp, and not until they get into the camp, do they notice that they have this major injury and start to feel the pain of that injury? Up to that time, they felt nothing. You'll see this kind of thing all about the sort of social con construction of pain. It turns out this is, uh, when I began to look into this, this is species general. So if you think about a lot of the cases that usually happen, so some kind of traumatic damage occur, occurs, and if that traumatic damage is, is um, caused by another animal, the last thing you want to do is sit back and lick your injured paw. You want to get the hell out of there. And so, quite, so what you see in a lot of cases is uh, this sort of a, it's a standard pain response, which is immediate response to the trauma, making noise, getting alerted, and so forth. And then a lot of people where the animal sort of carries on as usual until they can get back to where they usually um, nest or whatever. So. The placebo thing uh, here, um, seeking help reduces the experience of pain and manipulations of the quality of help changes the experience as well. So here uh, we'll just mill around till he's asleep and then send him back up. This operation is actually for placebo effect and those operations have occurred and they do help. Okay. Um, there's a lot of manipulations of this. And finally, it's real. The placebo effects um, influence the primary sensory neurons or the primary sensor recipient neurons in the, in the spinal cord. Their uh, placebo effects can be antagonized by naloxone. They're perfectly physiologically real down to the detail. So the idea is the, the motivational component of pain is get help. And if you do, the motivation is satisfied and the pain is lessened. It's not the only source. It's not the only thing to do about pain, but it's a component. And that's his argument for the placebo response. Uh, and so I'm going to do it one, step it out one more than Wall did. Um, so this comes from uh, interactions with Wendy Trevathan, this thing called obligate midwifery. Um, so there's, there's uh, this is one big component of, of useful pain research. Um, so first off, um, 
let's get an idea about how much leverage you'd have on survival, um, uh, depending on your conditions. Chances of death in childbirth, one or six, one in six in third world, one in 30,000 in Northern Europe. Um, so this isn't a comparison of helping and not, but it just gives you an idea of what you only need 1% to drive major evolutionary changes, and we've got much more. From anthropology and primatology, um, there are virtually no cultures where some form of aid isn't given, and most often it's uh, a cultural institution of midwives or doctors. Okay? Um, and uh, other primates, birth is solitary. Human childbirth um, is painful. Uh, is it painful because of cephalopelvic disproportion? In part, but it turns out that the small monkeys have it even worse. Uh, marmosets have a 50% um, uh, death rate due to cephalopelvic disproportion. So it's not that we're unusual. And how about hooves? <laughs> so, so we tend to dramatize this thing about the head, but really it's not particularly unique. Um, the longest and, and, and a painful part of childhood has nothing to do with this. It's simply stretching the cervix. It's, if you waited until the cephalopelvic disproportion comes into the picture, it's too late. So in this case, stretching the cervix is predictive of um, pain or the use of future pain or the use of health. Actually, and, and if you think about horses and ungulates, if you go... Um, um, if you decide to be in pain and take care of yourself as an antelope, you have just decided to become someone's lunch. So you can see why it might, you might have completely different um, situations surrounding childbirth. So I think that we have changed to give help. Well, how would we do that? Um, there's something really odd about human pain. So communication of pain in adult animals is extremely rare, but we do it all the time. And... Um, I'm arguing here that you can maybe understand where we get this from, from, from both sides of the mother-infant interaction, both in asking for help and for responding to that help, cry for help when it's given. This uh, messy uh, scan thing here, um, the tolerance for, for pain is in direct proportion to the proximity of the mom. So the idea is that this is now um, writ large. So. So the evidence I've given, these three things, and then we can make a whole lot of predictions that the cervical, that, that in the case of childbirth, the cervical stretching should be rewired or reorganized. Post-traumatic stress should be amplified so as to cause pain for a longer time to elicit caretaking. Brain reorganization integrates sociality and extension of infant getting maternal care um, should go into adulthood. And I want to talk about the third integrating sociality with the pain response. And I'll uh, talk about the insula. Um, it's an interesting part of the brain which gets a representation of uh, somatic sensation in the pain thing, visceral sensation in um, a gustatory map. And this is some very clever research, Critchley and Craig both, to show that, that while this primary somatosensory cortex maps out the absolute temperature for something, um, so this, this is the insula here. The um, insular cortex um, maps out the hedonic aspect of it, so you'd rather put your hand in hot water um, if you're pretty cold, but not if you're hot. So you have different preferences for water temperature, and that's what the insula measures that. Um, there's um, a gustatory. Uh, map in, in that same region that was described a long time ago. Interestingly, if you do imaging on this and you can show things that are actually disgusting, like spoiled food or acts that are morally disgusting, they activate the same part of the brain. And then a whole bunch of specialties about the insula that integrates social um, cues. So, um, so you get the same kind of activation for um, smelling a disgusting substance or watching someone else smell something disgusting. Um, down here, activations for um, looking at things that might cause pain eventually or for someone else's showing pain or actual infliction of pain on yourself. So there's this sort of sharing of code over the social domains. Um, okay, and uh, 
So I, Bud Craig made a, is the person who made a, a, an amazing reorganization of this whole pathway. We had identified pain with cutaneous pain far too much. And what he did was to integrate all the viscerosensory stuff, the stretch receptors and so forth the, in the intestines into a single lamina one ascending system that makes its way up to the ventromedial hypothalamus, ventromedial, um, thalamus and um, puts all of these things, the answer to how do you feel, into a single place, not just skin sensation pain as being you know, the kind of pain that you see. Um, on the other hand, he goes straight into the standard human exceptionalism argument. Um, so he says, the insular cortex doesn't exist in non-primates, which is going to be news to all the people who've been mapping the insular cortex in rats. Um, and you know, so it has a viscerosensory and a, an gustatory component. It's not a new cortical area. It doesn't have a new representation of it. And he goes on, in fact, to say it's probably the cause and the location of consciousness in humans. Um, but there are a lot of changes, and he doesn't need all that. The changes are good enough. So first off, there is a real change in long axon pathways. So in um, rodents, the uh, gustatory information stops in the pons, makes an obligatory synapse, goes to the thalamus. In primates, it goes straight through. One whole forebrain pathway is lost. The visceral sensation is a much bigger component in the human brain. And here's the interesting thing here. The type of this nucleus in VM goes from being a modulatory um, layer one and layer six projection nucleus to a primary projection kind of nucleus. And you can see that if you look in the macaque, we have a layer four in the most posterior part of insular cortex, which you don't see. Um, some are granular, but there's always some, there's always some thalamic input to the layer four area, but this one is trying to act like primary sensory cortex. So we have these um, real evidence of major and unexpected anatomical changes in that pathway. We don't, do not have a new cortical area that is possibly the seat of consciousness. Um, so here, so I went through all these things, and sorry, just about that. Yeah, this is it. Um, so we've, I've given that cell arrangements have changed in the pain pathway, that the relative size and innovation of parts have changed, so the, the human cortex is bigger and the insula is too. Long-range connectivity has changed, and that's a I, that's a rare event um, like the, that you get with things like the invention of the corpus callosum or sensory systems like the fish lateral line. To be investigated, it would be nice to look to see if you how that what the maternal infant interaction component of the brain is, and how you might plug it into this particular bit of the cortex. That's the place I would start. And what, what happened down there in the cervix anyway? What kind of, did you, did the kind of cells change or did they re, uh, project somewhere new or what? So overall, um, I'm trying to use this pain example as, as a, just an example about how you might use information that we have about what changes and what does not change in the organization of brains as you know, to start to hone in on how to ask a question. In this case, about somewhere I am making a case for human exceptionalism. You need to take a functional evolutionary approach. You have to put it in the context of natural behavior, and you have to um, understand the patterns of both of brain stability and variability. <laughs>